Hello and welcome. Today we're taking on the biomedical ethics issue of abortion. The readings for today are found in the Chapter 5 of Intervention and Reflection textbook, as well as Peter Singer's article, Taking Life, the Embryo and the Fetus. So let's jump into the history here. According to our textbook, from the founding of the U.S. until the mid-1800s, abortion was perfectly normal and acceptable until the point of quickening, roughly four to five months into the pregnancy, when the fetal movements became detectable by the mother. In the mid-1800s, the AMA began asking for restrictions. But it was not until 1873 when the question became a moral one, with the passing of the Comstock Law that sought to outlaw varieties of vice, including abortive drugs, contraceptives, and pornography. In 1973, a hundred years after the Comstock Law, the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision overturned the prohibition, at least within the first trimester of the pregnancy. Nowadays, though, the question has picked up a lot more moral weight and is being constantly fought over. The major lines of navigation are autonomy of the mother on the one hand and the right to life by the fetus on the other. And that brings us to a very important bit in this discussion, terminology. Bad terminology leads us to make all sorts of bad assumptions and make bad decisions because when your terminology is bad, everything else is inherently broken. A zygote is what you have from the conception in the fallopian tubes, or in a dish, to the implantation in the uterus. An embryo is what you have from the point of implantation to about eight weeks of pregnancy. Fetus is what you have from eight weeks on until birth. So what is abortion? Abortion is simply the termination of pregnancy, and it happens for one of three reasons internal physiological factors which produce a miscarriage, otherwise known as a spontaneous abortion, it can happen due to injury, or it can be induced, meaning that there is a human intervention that happens. Induced abortion from the point of zygote to embryo happens through medication. From the point of embryo until about week 16, or week 8 of fetus, it is done with a vacuum, and from week 16 until birth, it is done by extraction. And finally, there is therapeutic abortion, meaning that what is being done is some sort of a procedure to save the life of the mother that results in the abortion of the fetus. But the goal is not the abortion of the fetus itself, it is the preservation of the life of the mother. So why does this matter? Well, it matters quite a lot because it radically changes the context of situations that we're talking about. Get the terms wrong and everything else falls apart. So if a doctor inserts his hands into a woman to turn the child, it makes a lot of difference whether we're talking about a fetus as a child, that being inside the womb, or a baby in a car seat next to her. In these conversations, the key question is always, what is the person? And that is because a person is a member of society, and members of societies have rights. A person who cannot defend themselves has a right to be defended by others, including people with guns, from anyone who would intentionally harm them. But if we're not talking about a person, then the whole conversation changes. The thing to note here is that we never have conversations about when is it okay to murder people. Like, nobody disagrees about whether murder should be okay on Tuesday or on Thursday. Murder is just wrong and we're done with it. But the question of personhood is the basis of asking the question of whether or not what is happening here is murder or not. As we will see, the question of personhood is commonly brought to issues like reason and sense of self and so on. However, no matter which way you answer here, there will be problematic outcomes. A large portion of the conversation also turns on the distinction between moral obligations and personal rights, that being autonomy. This is then further problematized because we don't always agree on moral obligations. And if the fetus is considered a person, you suddenly you have competing claims of autonomy. A great summary of the issue is presented by our textbook authors. Quote, Should moral beliefs of some people serve as the basis for laws that will impose those beliefs on everyone? End quote. And we can add to that question, on what ground should beliefs of some group A be taken as the standard rather than those of group B? What, on pure numbers? On the moral rectitude of the claim? Moral according to whom? And according to which theory? And why should we be concerned with consequences rather than absolute claims to life, or vice versa? As you can see, this is messy and only about to get messier. 
So let's take a look at our ethical theories. Utilitarianism has the familiar line, yes, so long as happiness outweighs the pain. Why yes? Well, because from a utilitarian perspective, life itself has no intrinsic value, because nothing has any intrinsic value. It only has value insofar as it promotes happiness and gets rid of pain. Kantian ethics would seem to suggest that no, there is no right to abortion, because it would have to be universally unlimited. If any abortion is permissible, all abortions are permissible. And in the Kantian phrasing, all pregnant women ought to have abortions. On the one hand, that means that your mother should have aborted you, and that's inconsistent with you being alive. On the other hand, that also means that there cannot be a next generation of humans to have abortions, because they have all been aborted, and so the process self-terminates, no pun intended. And that means that the phrasing there ends up being incoherent. In case you're thinking, well, what about women whose life is in danger or who are only pregnant because of rape and incest, remember that Kant has no context built into those ethics. So the context is entirely irrelevant and it can't make any difference anyway. Ross, according to our authors, is most likely to push for a deontic line, but then structure some kind of prima facie way out of the Kantian pitch in order to allow for special case abortions, for extreme cases. In fact, our author seemed to push for that point for Kant as well, but that can't really work for Kant because there is no way to structure values in a hierarchical way. Ross can do so, but that's because his whole system is ultimately non-Kantian. From a Rawlsian perspective, it would likely be a somewhat limited yes to abortion. To have the ability to act autonomously is fairly paramount, except in cases where doing so would directly be harmful to everyone. Finally, the natural law ethical position, unsurprisingly, comes back with a resounding no, with possible exceptions for therapeutic abortions, and then only where the death of the fetus is not intended, but only foreseen. Now at this point we'll switch over to the Singer article. This is personally one of my favorites on the topic. Despite not being a big fan of Singer personally, his layout here is absolutely amazing. And what he does is unpack every option on all sides and presents it without his personal input until the very end. And he begins by giving us the anti-abortion argument in its logical form. Premise 1. It is wrong to kill innocent humans. Premise 2. A fetus is an innocent human. And the conclusion is that, therefore, it is wrong to kill fetuses. He also notes that the, quote, liberal position is most commonly to deny that second premise, i.e. to deny the humanity of the fetus, and that way the rest of the argument doesn't hold. Next, Singer presents us with a wonderful problem. The fetus, from zygote to birth, progresses with complete continuity. There is no significantly morally relevant difference in any point that would serve as a point of distinction between an embryo and a baby, between no rights and rights. And just in case you didn't follow that, here's the argument. If you can't find any point in development from zygote to child where the moral difference now obviously applies, then where should you draw the line? Well, you should not. Since you can't find a point where the rights ought to now suddenly apply, then the rights must be there all along. The zygote and onwards has the exact same rights as a fully developed and born child. That's option one. Option two is to take that same can't find a morally significant line position, but read it in reverse. If the zygote has no rights, then the child has no rights either. It becomes irrelevant that one is in the mother and the other one is out. Since the earlier version had no rights, the later version can't have any either because there is no clear line of differentiating the two. And so we're left with two options. One, the embryo is the same thing as a child, and therefore it has all the protections of a child. Or two, the child is the same thing as the embryo, and therefore it has none of the protections. Is this really the case? Is there really no differentiating line? Singer offers us some potential points. Birth is an obviously differentiating point, but it is also a bit silly. A fetus is identical to the child. The only difference is about 5 minutes and 2 feet of distance. Additionally, a child born at 7 months can survive, 
and that means that a child of two months, plus the seven in the womb, has rights that a more physically developed nine-month-old in the womb does not. For a rather terrifying example, think of it this way. The first child out of two, twins, is born. Having been born, he has a right to life. But the second one is not born yet. It is still in the womb. They are the exact same age. They may be exactly the same genetically. Yet the twin that is still in the womb has no rights and can be killed. Makes no sense. Option two is viability. This is another bad line of demarcation. Although it was used in Roe v. Wade to resolve the question, viability is the ability to survive on one's own. But as technology advances, the date keeps getting pushed back. Born at just 23 weeks and weighing in at 8.6 ounces, baby Sabi is the youngest surviving premature birth. But with new developments, let's say we figure out a completely artificial womb. At that point, do we push the right to life back to conception because now we can remove a zygote from the mother and transplant it? And what about the implications of location? Is it impermissible to have an abortion at six months because here in the U.S. the pregnancy is viable? But what if the pregnant woman goes off to some Pacific island with no technology? Is the abortion okay then because the lack of technology makes a fetus non-viable there? Do the ethical values then also change over time? An abortion at six months in the 1970s was morally fine, but now it's morally not okay? Also, the idea of being independent does not work from a different standpoint. We call the fetus viable, but it is not, and neither is the baby born at full 40 weeks, in the sense of being anything other than entirely dependent on others for its survival. Sure, the feeding no longer comes in by placenta, but if left alone, both will die in a matter of days at most. The same is also true for the sick, the elderly, or the injured under the right circumstances. And if you shot your grandmother as an alternative to a nursing home because she could not survive on her own, I'm pretty sure everyone would agree that you committed a murder. Option three is the quickening, and it is simply bad science. The fetuses move around a lot earlier, though the mother does not feel it. And we know this because when we perform ultrasounds at much younger fetuses than four to five months, at which point quickening usually occurs, we do see the fetus moving about. Finally, option four is the consciousness argument. And that one does not bode well either. And this is because we can start detecting brain activity at seven weeks. But it's not quite clear what that should mean. What brain activity should count? So now we can't draw a decent line for when the fetus gets rights. And that means that it either always has them, or neither the fetus nor the baby have them. On the other side, there are arguments regarding the various problems of restrictive abortion laws. Restrictive laws simply push abortions into the shadowy areas without the proper care for the women. Thus, it doesn't stop abortions, it only makes them more harmful. But this is a bad argument for two entirely separate reasons. First, it is an argument against the law against abortions. It's not an argument about the morality of abortions. And two, we have not, and will not, take that approach to any other number of activities seen as wrong, including, let's say, crack use. If you are breaking the law and therefore placing yourself at an increased risk, that's kind of what should happen if you're actively breaking the law. Imagine if somebody told you that we need to decriminalize drugs because people illegally selling drugs are more likely to run from the cops and die in the chase as a result. Well, maybe they shouldn't be selling drugs or running from the cops. We don't legalize their activities because otherwise they have higher risks. What we try to do is get them to stop doing the criminal things. A better argument is that because it is an event that impacts the women, it ought to be the business of the woman, not the law's business. And thus, the role of law in this situation should be non-existent. The law is only here to prevent my activities from being harmful to others. And since abortion is not harmful to others, there is no need for a law. However, the issue here is that if the fetus has rights, like the rest of us do, then there is actually somebody being harmed, namely the fetus. So Singer then argues that life should not be viewed as having intrinsic importance or value, which is completely in line with utilitarian standards. And he does this on the basis of the idea of personhood. 
So if the normal human is what we call a person, a fetus is certainly not a person because they are not a normal human. Well, why not? A normal human has things like reason and self-consciousness and so forth. But if to be human, we merely need to be a homo sapien, then being human is an arbitrary feature of some collection of molecules. In other words, the homo sapiens distinction does not confer any kind of special status, and then no one has any rights. As a result, the act of abortion does not end some intrinsic set of values. The value there is at best potential. Meanwhile, the survival of the mother, at least in terms of therapeutic abortions, should always be understood as paramount. She actually has existing value. She has reason. She has self-consciousness. She has actual existence. So what about the potential of the embryo? Well, Singer tells us that the potential to be something is not the same thing as being that something. You don't have rights of the things you might become until or unless you become those things. The acorn does not have the status of an oak. The egg does not have the status of a chicken. And your potential to murder does not make you a murderer. Singer ends with the argument that it is true that there is no meaningful way to draw a distinction between a baby and a fetus. Thus, he argues that the moral reading implies that the rights of persons should not be extended to fetuses. However, he thinks that there are also potentially good reasons to kill babies. Not for fun, but for meaningful moral reasons. The kinds we have already touched on in the genetic and reproductive control sections. This way, he is in line with his earlier understanding. Either all fetuses have the rights of babies, or babies are as deprived of rights as fetuses. And again, because Peter Singer is a fairly famous utilitarian, you should understand where this kind of argument is coming from. For my money, I think that the attempt to bring the moral and the legal aspects in line on this case simply do not work. Or rather, the only way they can be made to work is in the presence of a dystopian-level authoritarian system. Let's consider that the most extreme anti-abortion side is entirely in the right. Abortion, for any reason, is exactly the same as murder. And let's assume that we can get a law in place that will treat women who have abortions and abortion providers and so on as murder one criminals. Now, how do we enforce that? Well, how do we enforce this standard on the adult-on-adult -adult murders? Well, what we do is we try to catch them after the fact, but, but how would we do this for abortions? Well, we don't, because we can't. Even if you have a complete ban on abortion and murder prosecution laws in place, I can get around all of that with about uh, $500 and a weekend. Fly to any place that abortions are legal. For example, Canada, Mexico City, Sweden, Norway, Germany, UK, France, Switzerland, Spain, Russia, Romania. Get the abortion, see some sites, and then fly back home. All that legal procedure we put in place, and the only people affected are those without the $500 in a weekend. So the only way to deal with that workaround is to biochip all women so that the government will know as soon as they become pregnant. And then, if they travel abroad, you have to send a squad of ninjas to follow them around to ensure that the miscarriage was actually an abortion. That seems a bit excessive, since we don't take those kinds of precautions to stop adult-on-adult -adult murders. Perhaps the answer here may be specifically in not equating the moral position with the legal one. Perhaps this is a case where the moral and legal system simply cannot be the same. The example I like to use is that of St. Augustine, who dies around 430 AD. And he's writing about the problem of moral evil of prostitution. And he notes that although prostitution is certainly a moral evil, it should not be outlawed by the state. The reason, as he explains, is that the state ultimately has no way of actually enforcing such a law. That is, the law is just letters on a page without any oomph to it. As a result, the only outcome is that, in addition to breaking the moral law, people would only get more used to the idea of breaking state laws. In a similar vein, there is no meaningful way to actually prevent abortions. All we can do is require the people who wish to have them to take the extra step of flying out of the country. I'm willing to bet that, with internet and improved access to, well, everything, in the next 10 years, you will be able to simply look up a recipe for essentially an abortion drug, order the ingredients based on your weight, and make the drug yourself, safely, privately, etc. 
So the law is simply unable to actually regulate the issue, in which case the best move may be to simply condemn the action as a moral evil, if that is your view, but leave the legal system out of it. Finally, notice that this position is not that it's not the law's business. It might be the law's business, depending on your perspective, but it is not reasonably enforceable. As such, the debate is meaningless, the law is pointless, and we can certainly do much more about actually solvable issues with the same resources. As a final point, I would like to address certain arguments that get thrown around a bunch, but which are very poorly constructed. Now, I do this because of consistency. Our ideas must be at least generally universal and work across different ethical questions if we wish to have anything like a coherent ethical system. We saw in the Warren reading, as well as the excerpt from Judith Thompson's argument presented by Singer, the pro-choice idea that the right to abortion should be unrelated to one's responsibility for pregnancy, and that issues such as feeling ready and not making the child a punishment for unwanted outcomes should be an argument for the pro-choice positions. These arguments are ultimately arguments from autonomy. However, the exact same position can be turned around to some extent by considering the father of a child unwanted by him, even if it is wanted by the mother. Given the U.S. laws regarding paternity and financial obligations, is the man not placed in the same position of being made to suffer for a careless mistake? Is it not a form of punishment on him that the child is born? What about men who do not feel ready to have a child? Are they exempt from legal obligations? What about cases of children with extreme disabilities and the additional psychological and financial costs that come with that? Both the prospective mother and father committed the exact same act. In both cases, an unwanted pregnancy has the exact same potential to derail their lives, but only the woman has the ability to end the pregnancy. And whether the man desires the child or not, for any reason, he is under legal obligation, not only a moral one, and his autonomy is subjugated by the autonomy of the mother. That is, the only concerns that the law takes into account are the concerns of the mother. This is also true in cases of rape, as men are victims of some 38% of all rape cases, or of misappropriated sperm, where the woman obtains the sperm with the intention of getting pregnant, despite the objections of the man. One way out is to legally demand abortions unless both parents agree to have the child. However, that may mean forced abortions, and that seems, well, wrong on every ethical theory except maybe extreme cases in utilitarianism. The other way out, while remaining consistent on ethical values like autonomy, is to argue for something like that the parent or parents who desire the child are the ones legally and financially responsible for the child. In that case, a prospective father who does not wish to have a child can sign over his rights and release himself from the obligation, and a prospective mother who does not wish to have a child could have an abortion. Additionally, if the prospective father wanted a child and the mother did not, she would have the choice of either having an abortion, even over his objections, or essentially functioning as a surrogate that is, carrying the child to term and giving it over to the father, while he covered the varieties of costs associated with the process. In this way, the idea of autonomy, used to anchor the pro-choice position, would actually be strengthened, because it would be more consistent with the rest of the child and abortion-related features of moral and legal consequences. But without this kind of adjustment, or something like it, the result is the severe undermining of the very notion of autonomy by subjugating the autonomy of one gender to the other. And this is the exact scenario that the pro-choice activists say that they are trying to fight against. So, we did not yet consider how these chapters work together, but we will do so at the end of our next one, dealing with impaired infants. And that way the full spectrum of these issues can come together for a single general analysis. Now, I hope that this lecture gave you a bit more insight on the varieties of issues on abortion. Obviously, it did not cover the whole thing. There's plenty of weird moral and legal cases and arguments that are out there, but I wanted you to see some of the most pertinent ones, and especially the ones that are book lists. So, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments or email me.